Welcome to the Merland. I'm Dominic Machado, and today I'm joined by Estelle Vasudevan in Colombo, Sri Lanka's number one cricket journalist, and Nick Brooks, Sri Lanka's premier cricket historian in London. We've got a lot to cover today. Sri Lanka has just completed a series victory over New Zealand for the first time in 12 years. We've got a test series coming up in South Africa that's effectively a quarterfinal for the World Test Championship. And we've got the IPL Mega Auction. Before we get into all of that, um, just a couple reminders, housekeeping items. If you're listening, whatever platform you're listening on, like, subscribe, comment, follow. We love to hear your comments. We love when you guys get involved and tell us what you think and tell us that we're talking all sorts of nonsense, but keep it clean. <laughs> no misogyny. Um, and um, if you're looking for a mortgage, make sure to check out Mike Ward. He's got you covered in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, and in the UK. And one very special announcement. Uh, we are very happy to announce that starting this week, we are going to launch a franchise cricket podcast as well. Um, obviously, in um, in concert with the IPL Mega Auction, but look for it. It's called The Big Bag. All right. Uh, we'll post it on our socials. Information will come out about it. And we're looking to talk about that big auction um, coming up later this week. Okay. Um, so now we've got all the preliminaries done. Let's start talking about some of the cricket. Okay, so when we previously recorded, we kind of did a preview for this whole New Ze Zealand series, this two T20s and then three ODIs. Um, Sri Lanka and New Zealand split that T20 series, just two games, and then Sri Lanka whitewashed New Zealand 2-0 in the ODI series, their first win over New Zealand in an ODI series in, I think, 12 years. Um, so from sort of the 30,000 foot view, a good result. Okay. Um, but as there were some, there were some dodgy moments where um, Sri Lanka was unable to chase 109 um, in the second T20 against New Zealand. Um, 209 played 210 in the last ODI. So the pitches were a bit iffy. So, um, Estelle, I'll come to you first. How do you evaluate this historic series win against New Zealand? Yeah, I mean, as you said, as a result, it's a good result, right? Um, it's always good to keep winning and to keep that kind of, um, what do you call the momentum going for Sri Lanka. And they've had, what, five series wins, ODI series wins this year. Some against really good opposition like India and I mean, I guess you would consider New Zealand also amongst them, despite them not really being a full strength team for this series. So in that aspect, I think it's a good thing. I don't know how much we learned about the team or, you know, tactically how much we learned through this series because um, guys who you would have wanted to perform like the Sadir Samara Vikramas, Janet Lee and Agays didn't really have big series, but on the flip side, I think it, it would give players like uh, Kusal Mendis some some real confidence. Mahish Tikshana's batting has come a long way. His bowling has been brilliant. I think overall, he just, this, in the last few months, he looks like a much, much improved player. It's not that he was a bad player at all, right? He was already good. Yeah. But he, he looks like a much, much improved player. So there are those positives. I think we've made it clear what we think about the pitchers and what we think about the tactics of having pitchers, which basically neutralize your strength if you are a spin bowling team, right? If you have good spinners, it basically brings the other team spinners to your level because it's that uh, spin friendly. So I think we've, we've kind of made it clear what we, what we feel about the, I know a lot of people didn't agree with us, but um, it's 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 interesting to see how we go now because obviously no champions trophy but the team management seems to have made it clear that they want their focus is on ranking so Sri Lanka up to number five if I'm not mistaken yeah, so that's say, that's think, some progress yeah I think with this win they now jump New Zealand um, for the number five position which is probably the highest they've been since. 2014 or 2015, if I if I had to guess, Nick, your evaluations. 
Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Estelle said. I was pretty shocked that this was the first time Sri Lanka had beaten New Zealand in the past 12 years in an ODI <laughs> series. Uh, but yeah, the wins keep mounting up for Sanath and the boys. Uh, the T20 series was a little strange, played out on a Saturday and Sunday. It had a bit of a mm. blink and you'll miss it feel about it. Uh, and the ODIs, again, they were slightly rain-ravaged, weren't they? But I agree with everything Estelle said about Theeks. I think Kusal Mendes rightly earned player of the series for the ODIs. But I was so impressed with Tikshana in uh, all three forms. His bowling is on fire. His batting was really good in that second ODI. And in the first ODI, he took a catch at mm. Sean McWicket, I think, mm -hmm. where the ball was mm -hmm. absolutely clattered at him. I mean, that would have been knocking me out and I wouldn't have been waking up till 2025. Uh, he historically <laughs> hasn't been the best fielder. So to see him get his hands up to that and hold on was really nice. And he, we've talked about him being in and out since Sanath took over right and i think that he should be a permanent fixture in this odi team so it's great to see that it's nice to see dilshan madashanka getting some game time he did take a bit of tap up front i think we've seen enough of madashanka now to know that when the ball doesn't swing he can mm -hmm. be quite leaky in that power play but he came back really well right bowling cutters at the yeah. back end and took two and two uh yeah Again, I don't think we learned that much from this New Zealand series. I don't know if you guys have felt the same, but like it's felt like a bit of a non-event for me with mm. their weakened team and Sri Lanka obviously looking forward to what is a huge pair of tests in South Africa. And I think more than anything, it's just a bit baffling and a little bit frustrating to see Kamindu and Asitha mm. and Patham um, and even Kusol, although he's had a fantastic series, like should these guys be there? I was just working on a piece and I chatted to Jehan Mubarak and Damika Sudarshana, both coaches, both already in South Africa doing work mm. with the players who are there. And you do kind of wonder why half the squad isn't there, given that these are Sri Lanka's biggest tests in um, as long as I can remember. Yeah, that decision making, I think, is is questionable and especially and nick you pointed this out on on social media Kamindo is bat coming into bat at seven he came into bat at four admittedly in that second odi and he's bowling a couple over of, of ospin there's really nothing added for him right you have and and in sadira and, and jonathan Leonage, you have players who can basically fill come into his role right who are already playing in the 11 and you can bring in somebody else to try it out, right? That's where you could say, okay, Tumindu with Kramasinga, come in and bowl a few overs and hit the ball around a little bit. Um, so that's that's a bit baffling. Um, again, I think one of the things that's so exciting about the team is that it has depth. Like, when you look at the side they played, even without Kusal, Potham, Kamindu, and Asita, it's an exciting side, Right. Um, Nishan Madushka is opening the batting. Avishka, who scored 100, right? Um, shout out to Avishka for that. And Nuanindu Fernando is also batting. They brought in Lahiru Udara as a, he didn't, he wasn't going to play, but he was one of the, uh, he was in the squad as well. So there's a lot of talent around this team. And especially against kind of New Zealand's B team, it would have been a good opportunity to test out some of those players and to see what they had at the highest level of international cricket. So that's one thing for me. Um, I definitely agree about Thikshana. Um, he has looked a million bucks. I mean, the thing for me that's so, so good to see is how much he's actually turning the ball. Um, mm. When he can bowl that fast, right? Like he's pushing well beyond 100 kph now and get turn. That's like that is very very rare right that's like Rashid Khan level that's what we're talking about we're talking about somebody who can bowl flat can bowl quick but still extract um very well from the pitch and then it's just nice to see him bat like that and have that confidence and come out there because we know that's something he's been working on um and it's going to increase his value not only for Sri Lanka's team but um as a, a player who's up for auction at the IPL too mm -hmm. um also, Kusal Mendes, I think one thing that, I guess, to, to Sanat's credit, right, that mental, the mental part of the preparation of winning, of playing well, of doing the right things, um, 
we could say that it has had a positive positive impact on Kusal, right? So he plays one type of innings in that first ODI when he scores 143, and then he plays a completely different type of innings that second ODI where he just bats through. He doesn't – there was no real time where he even looked like he was going to throw it away, right? I think that's something we've seen in Kusal Mendes innings. He's, you know, batting. He looks good, and then all of a sudden he plays a shot. But he was – determined not to do that so maybe the the sort of mental aspect of okay we're going to win we're going to try to win that has some positive characteristics um the one question i want to throw to you is again i think we tend to view what's going on in sri lanka cricket in um in the sri lanka cricket bubble but while our t20 series is going on there was another t20 series going on between south africa and india Right, and I think um, India in one of those matches outscored our, uh, the cumulative score of both of our matches. Right, they scored two hundred eighty-four. Was it Nick? Yeah, uh, yeah, I believe it was. 200, yeah, two hundred eighty-four. Um, and India has effectively rebuilt their squad, and they are now playing a supercharged version of T Twenty cricket. Um, and I think it's just really important for us to remember that. Yeah, we might be winning, but this is not going to work in other places. And there's going to be much tougher challenges in different places in different parts of the world, right? Um, and they were also doing that with, um, like, no Jaiswal, no Gill, no Pan. Yep. Mm. Um, a number of players who'd be in their first 11, like, missing because they're... I wonder how many who actually, actually played that World Cup final mm. were in the eleven. Yeah, right? Maybe at least in the back Shah, I think was it just it, it might have only been Arsteep Shah and Sky and Sky those two were yeah because Sky was there Hardik was there yeah mm. uh, but yeah. it was Samson and Tilak doing the damage wasn't it yeah and yep. totally yep. different pitches to the kind of ones Sri Lanka are serving up yep uh, and, and they have deep spin and they're using different types of spinners. Varun Chakravarti has, has shown himself to be very, very valuable. Um, and they're getting this experience, you know, playing. And, and, and India is 24 and 2 in their last 26 mat, uh, T20 matches, right? That's, to me, that's investment paying off from being at the forefront of T20 cricket for the last 5, 10 years. And I, you know, it's going to be hard to beat that 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 type of squad. Um, I want to ask. So, Nick, you brought up Dilshan Madhushanka, uh with this New Zealand series. Do you feel? And we've already kind of brought up that some young players may be missed out. One of the, how do you feel about Sri Lanka's white ball? Fa- oh, sorry, white ball fast bowling units and how they're being utilized in these series. Uh, I've got to say again, I sound like I'm flogging a dead horse, but I don't understand why Asifa has to play every game. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's workload management, and it's great to see the strides that he's taken as a white ball bowler in the past six months. But we were talking about it off air. And, you know, if you look back to the probably what the 50 over World Cup, which was pretty much this time last year, he was way down the pecking order. And so why all of a sudden he his name has to be penned in when we know that Sri Lanka are going to need him to bowl long, tough spells in South Africa Mm. surprises me. Uh, Yeah. I don't know. I mean, Eshamalinga got a debut today, didn't he? We didn't see much of him. Not a debut, but a game today. We didn't see yeah. much of him. Uh, yeah, I don't really know what's going on with Sri Lanka's SEMA rotation at the moment. We never know really what what the situation is with Chimera. Uh Kumara seems to have been set aside as a guy who's going to be a test match specialist for the time mm. being at least. Uh, which I understand. I do find it strange given that pretty much the mm-hmm. last time we saw him in an ODI was against England in the World Cup when he had one of his best spells. Uh, so, yeah, to answer your question, Dom, I don't really know what's going on there. But just so we don't get shouted out for bringing pure doom and gloom again, I'll just pick up on an earlier point you made, which, which was Kusal. And I think uh, I've got to say that, like, Man, I'm shocked that that was Kusal's fourth ODI 100. Every time I see these 100 figures, I'm baffled by them. And 
I think that Sanath has really helped him in his game. And I think we've got to say that Kusal Mendes has delivered in drips and drabs for so long and he still continues to infuriate in patches. But if you look at what he's done over the past yeah. year, that body of work, I think there's an argument to be made that it's maybe his best year in international cricket. And yeah. uh, hopefully signs that we're still going to see the player that we thought he could become um, emerge. And yeah, maybe he might have a really big tour of south africa it's yeah. so funny to me because like when he when he started off and he played that innings against australia in in was it palla Cali, yeah. um it like all of us had kind of pegged him as he's going to be like a great test batter right he's going to be one of sri lanka's best ever test batters but as the years have gone by, he's never really been able to fulfill that potential. But in the last couple of years, he's turned into one of Sri Lanka's best limited overs batters, hasn't he? I mean, like if you look at him by global standards, he's been right at the top, I feel, in T20 cricket and uh, in, particularly in T20 cricket. He's just kind of maybe finding his way in ODI cricket a bit more over the last few series. But he's been right at the top and I feel like a lot of the criticism he gets is because he hasn't been making runs in test cricket where yeah. people were kind of expecting him to be Aravinda or something, right? But um, in limited overs, overs cricket and I feel like, yes, Sanat, there is credit due to him but also I think what a lot of people are forgetting and no, I don't have anything personal against Sanat Jayasurya. <laughs> he <laughs> was a great player. Um but what I'm trying to say is that, yes, credit is due. But if you look at um, the test team, if you look at even the ODI team, okay, mm -hmm. if realistically, I think we were recording, yeah, we were recording before the 2023 World Cup, right? And I think yeah. even at that point, Sri Lanka had a good enough team to compete for at least fifth or sixth on that table. Yeah. It's just that once they lost one or two games, it was all downhill from there. Um and I think that is what we need to see improvement on. How do they perform in games that matter? Yep. And obviously tournaments, right? Because we've seen them since like 2021 with Miki Arthur in charge. That was the T20 World Cup where Sri Lanka kind of surprised everyone. Oh, yep. suddenly they're good, right? Then 2022, there were expectations. They did, did badly after winning the Asia Cup. Yeah. 2023, there were expectations. Again, they did badly. I'm not saying Sri Lanka were going to win the World Cup in either of those occasions, right? But Sri Lanka had done well in bilaterals. Like, I think if you look at the, like, people are talking about the home record, right? In bilateral yeah. cricket. Sri Lanka have been successful for more than a year. Like, it's not mm. been after Sanat that they've been successful. They've had success yeah. in the recent past. Sure, there is an impact from him. I think that win at all costs and winning is everything mentality is definitely coming from Sanat. But it's also kind of a steady growth. But where they need to prove themselves now is can they perform in games that matter? And I think the test series will be the first test because we legitimately have a chance of making it to the final of the World Test Championship, which no... like. Trust me, I I to like I work with people who don't work in like who don't follow Sri Lanka cricket that much. No one no one was looking at Sri Lanka at the start of this World Test Championship, right? Yeah. I mean, last time we were in contention for the final until the last bit as well, but everybody knew it's gonna be India, Australia, or India, England or whoever, right? But yeah. this time Sri Lanka legitimately have a chance to get there on their own with their own performances. And that series, I think, will tell us a lot about where the where the mindset of the players are, whether they can handle that kind of pressure and whether they can kind of perform when like when something is really on the line for them. Yeah. So I think you make a number of great points and also have given us kind of a perfect segue for the, the next next part of what we're going to talk about. But um, I think you're 100 percent right that. One, we've won, I think, 10 ODI bilateral series at home in a row, and that started in 2021. So it's something we've been good at, right? We, we need to be honest about that and say we've already been pretty good at ODIs at home. Um, obviously, beating India is, is, a, is a big plus. But um, and in 2023, we had won 13 consecutive matches at one point. So we were also winning. 
I think I like the idea about the intensity that Sonath is bringing, right? Like that every game matters and that trying to win every game is important. And I think it's a mentality that's really important to instill in these players. But I, I think the real test is going to come when they have to go overseas and do it in unfamiliar conditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, just to kind of cite one example, and again, I'm not trying to be purposely be negative, but we're just trying to set realistic expectations about where this team is. Right In that first ODI, Sri Lanka were 180 for one in the 30th over, right? Great position. They should absolute, you basically have a T20 game after that, right? 20 overs, all your wickets intact. You should be, you should be scoring at least 170 runs, right? You should be getting to 350 there. But they had three or four batters who were batting slower than a run of ball. Only Kusal and, and Charith were able to kind of fit the bill for the kind of batting that they needed to see in order to uh, get a big score, right? So that's the kind of thing that I'm looking for is we know they can, as Estelle said, we know they can score 225 overs, but can they make the 350s? Can they make the 400s? Can they find the formula to do that consistently? We still haven't seen that under Sonas, right? And that's why they had failed at the 2023 World Cup. Um, Again. And again, some baffling thinking there to send Sadira ahead of Charith and then to send Lianage in Raya the Death when yeah. Kamindu's sat in the hutch. Like, Kamindu's been the best finisher for Sri Lanka over the past few months, right? And Lianage is an accumulator. Like, And also, there are, there's a right-hander at the crease. Surely you yeah. want a left-hander to counteract that. I just can't explain <laughs> any of that decision-making from any perspective or any angle. Right. Right. And, and that's, th those are the things that we're worried about. It's not that they aren't winning and all that stuff. It's that we want to see them making the right decisions because also all the other teams in the world are on top of their game when it comes to that. Right. You're never going to see an in India make that kind of mistake. You're never going to see an Australia make that kind of mistake. So to win those crunch moments, right, you have to be on top of your game. Uh, but let's, um, let's flip over to this big test series against South Africa coming up. All right, so we've got two test matches, the first in Durban, the second in Port Elizabeth. Basically, um, a rehash of what happened in 2019, right, where we played the first match in Durban and then in Port Elizabeth. It's, in addition to 2019, it's where we've had historically the most success in South Africa. Those pitches take spin. And both South Africa and Sri Lanka have named their sides one one thing to kind of point out, this is effectively a, like a quarterfinal um, for the World Test Championship. There are five teams that are still in the running. India, Australia, South Africa, Sri Lanka, and I think New, and New Zealand. New Zealand? Is the, New Zealand, yeah, is the fifth team that has a chance. And um, South Africa kind of looks like it has the best pathway forward mm -hmm. in that they have two home series against Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Um, Australia have to play India and Sri Lanka, but Sri Lanka is an away series. Um, and Sri Lanka obviously has to play South Africa and then Australia at home. So Sri Lanka needs to effectively take one of these two games from South Africa in order to put, keep themselves in the running for this mm. final at Lords. So as Estelle said, right, this is a real test. They have to win one of these games. They have to figure out a way to win one of these games. They can't blow a game and then just put all the pressure on the last game. They need to play well from the jump. But they're going back to a place where they've recently had success, and they're playing a South African test team, which, while it won in Bangladesh, is not the strongest test team they've had in years. Um, there's a lot of players who are new to the side, new to test cricket. Um, so we'll start with you, Nick. What are your thoughts on that 17 person squad that Sri Lanka has released for, uh, the test series? Yeah. I mean, I think it's largely without surprises, uh, Embledenia for me was a huge kind of shock when I saw that name. I think that he's been picked largely on the form that he showed the last time Sri Lanka were in South Africa, which mm -hmm. seems a strange way of uh, selecting a side. I know he's done okay in domestic cricket, but to pick someone because they did well in a series that was, what, five years ago uh, mm -hmm. seems a little unusual. But I would expect him to not play. I mean, 
you would have thought that they'll go one spinner being Prabha and three seamers. Uh, and then you've got Nishan Pires there as well, who I would say is the next cab off the rank in terms of yep. spin bowling. So Embaldeni is really there in case of injury, I suppose. Uh, Oshada Fernando picked ahead of Nishan Madushka, again, a guy who's done well in South Africa in the past. And he was called into that New Zealand squad, wasn't he? Having had a good A-team tour yes. to South Africa, I believe, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he knows the conditions well. But again, I think we know what Sri Lanka's top seven is going to be. If it was anything other than what it is for that last uh, test against New Zealand, I think everyone will be hugely surprised. Uh, I was a little surprised that Vanders was dropped from the squad, having um, you know done really well in limited overs cricket every time he's gotten a go in the past few months. And so yeah, done nothing wrong. I was surprised to see him replaced. Uh, other than that, nothing too big. Just a kind of question that I'll put to you guys. Uh, given we know what Kasson Rajitha can do and we know that he's going to be probably the bowler who is least, the seamer who's least likely to feature, would you have any, um, have had any desire to maybe see Dilshan Madashanka go as part of that squad as a kind mm. of X Factor bowler who, you know, probably won't play but could have been a bolter? Um, I'm not convinced. I I feel like Deshan Madhushanka is struggling to kind of find rhythm, right? Because he's kind of been in and out of the team in limited overs cricket. Um, whereas Kasun Rajita is your, he's your, the best backup you can have, right? He's been yeah. your backup for limited overs cricket, test cricket, wherever it is. And whenever he's been given the opportunity, he's been right on the money. I feel like that's that insurance type of player that you have. Just on Mandase, I feel like if you look at the two selections, Nishan Piris and um, Ambodenia, they're looking for tall guys who might extract mm. a bit of bounce, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. just the way they bowl. Because I was very surprised to see Ambodenia as well because they announced the uh, kind of the the group of players who are traveling ahead to South Africa, right? And he was in that list. Like, when did we last see Lasit Ambodenia in the test squad or get Two an opportunity? Ago, yeah. yeah, and then with Nishan Piris also picked, you get the feeling like that's what they're looking for, right? They're looking for someone who can maybe get that bit of extra bounce, not really expecting the ball to spin a lot, but mm. uh, to have that. And that's that's the success you saw from Ambudani last time, right? He wasn't turning the ball square or anything. It was just like bowling really accurately, getting that extra bit of bounce, using the pace, stuff like that. So I think that might be the thinking behind it, which, which I guess is good. And I think, again, to one thing that I've seen, or I don't know whether I'm also noticing it just because it's Sanat, but like, is that they're looking a bit more like horses for courses. They're looking like they might be a little more flexible rather than saying, okay, no, these eight players are definitely playing and we have to fill just two gaps. Instead, they're maybe saying, I think that was the case with Mahish as well, right? Where there was, you know he's good, but you think someone else would be a better fit given the given certain conditions. Whether whether that's right or wrong uh, is is the question. But I feel like that type of thinking has maybe come into play a lot more uh, under Sanath. Yeah, I think Sanath is definitely not afraid to make changes. We saw that in England, right? Um, he made a couple changes for every match to kind of try to do different things, and and he made the the very uh, aggressive call to drop Prabath. For the last yeah. match, which I was, I did not like, but it worked out really well, right? Going with four seamers there. Um, I think one, so in terms of the squad, yeah, I'm a little surprised about Embledenia. Um, Sadira is there, obviously, as a backup Shadi wicketkeeper. Um, that, that, was the, that was the only question mark for me. Like, who could we have picked instead of, because Sadira has... The, the sad thing with Sadira is that when he's in form, he looks like a million bucks. Yeah. And then he goes out of form and he's out of form for a very, very long time. Yeah. Right? He, he doesn't, it's not like 10 games. It's like a year of cricket where he just yeah. can't find himself. Uh, so that was the one that I, you could maybe question. Maybe someone like Lahir Udara might have been uh, yeah. an option since he did well in that South Africa A series. 
and has been in really good form as well, right? Lahiro Udara and and or Nishan Madushka, right? If you don't want to blood someone, right? You and you need a backup keeper. Um, Madushka has played that role before. Um, or I guess you don't even need to carry. It, assuming that Chundi is capable of keeping, right? You could even get away with not carrying um, an extra player there. I think um, one thing that if, if we want one sort of out of the box choice. Um, or maybe two out of the box choices. One person I was thinking of is maybe giving uh, Thikshana a shot in Test, especially in South Africa with this kind of uh, very fast, flat off spinners. Um, he's constantly at you in terms of landing on a spot and forcing you to play. Um, I could see that being an interesting bit. And then now that he can bat a little bit, you know, Mahesh Thikshana, the all rounder in, in Test, uh, could be something coming. But I, uh, that's one out, out out of the box pick. The other one was Eshan Malinga, who also played in that South Africa A series and who also was impressive. Um, I think it probably would be difficult to play both Malinga and Kamara in that they're mm. kind of that um, first change bowler who comes in and is at you and bowls for three or four overs, and then you take him out. So it's probably pretty hard to play two guys like that. Um, which brings me to the question, if you're, for that first match in Durban, what does your bowling lineup look like? I think Nick. I would go uh, Asifa, Kumara, Prabha, and Milan Ratnaika. I think, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I feel, I'm, I'm torn even saying that, right? I think Ratnayaka offered control in England. I thought his bowling got better as the mm. series went on and being able to bat at number eight, he kind of balances the side a little bit. I think Asitha and Kumar are going to be the key men. Mm. And as he did in England at times, Prabhu's going to have to bowl long spells. Uh, but, I mean, I, I can see an argument for picking Vishwa over Milan, but I think that if you've got you know, that 8, 9, 10, 11, you just feel that as soon as you're five wickets down, the innings is yeah. over. Right? Over, yeah. Especially against Rabada and the like, but right? Is that also one of the things that Sanat has kind of, or oh, it's reported that he's, he's focused on is that tailenders need to be able to bat mm. and, yeah. and get those which which is a great thing, right? Like you said, yeah. you don't want the, the last three wickets to be walking wickets. I would say Asita, I hope they've wrapped him. Or he's in an ice bath right now. <laughs> um, uh, Lahiru uh, should be the first two pit, and of, of course Prabhat. And for the third seamer, I mean, to be honest, I feel like Kasum Rajita is a good option because he's got that height and he's got he's again he's got the control and stuff, right? Mm. And Vishwa was one of the the rare disappointments in England. I felt because he. All of us were expecting him to have a fabulous time because he'd done so well in, in during his county stint and he kind of had, had a gauge of the conditions and all of that. Um, I think they'll go with Vishwa, but I wouldn't mind seeing uh, Kasim Rajita. Mm -hmm. Milan Ratan is a good option. I think his stocks are high because he does offer something with the bat. Um, but yeah, I'd yeah. like to see Kasim. I was going to say with, with, with Kasim and... and Vishwa, it's for me. It's between the two of them as the third mm -hmm. seamer. They both had success in that in that South Africa tour. They both used the conditions well. I think if Vishwa looks good and is hitting his length and getting the ball to swing, it's it's very hard to keep him out of the side. Yeah. Um, and hey, he's a gritty batter. We we saw what he did with KJP in that famous one fifty three, right, where he just batted out. Um, I, I, 70 balls, something uh, like a ridiculous number of mm. balls to make sure that that... And he uh, got hit so many times, right? Yeah. So many times. He faced, a, you know, Dale Stain and yeah. was like, there was, I was just like, this is going to be, you know, there's no way he's going to survive this for that many overs, but but he did. So, you know, I think if they can get Vishwa back on form, that's the best thing for them. Yep. Um, but Kasim Rajatha is also bowled well. He gets at this seam and swing, you know, he's got the good bounce, he's got the good height. Um, but I think the really exciting thing is actually with the exception of Asita, all of them can look back in South Africa. Lahiru Kumara's um, debut as a 19-year-old, mm. right? He took sick 
six wickets in in um, in an innings, including a first wicket of Hashim Elmas. So they can all look back and think about good times um, they've had there. So let, let's um, let's kind of think a little bit about Sri Lanka's batting. Um, the big threat in this, the the two big threats in this South African bowling lineup, to my mind, are Kagiso Rabada who looked absolutely lights out in the past couple of series he's played. He's now got 300 test wickets for his career. I think he's massively underrated as a test bowler because people don't talk about South African cricket as much as they, they should. Um, and Keshav Maharaj, who's kind of been in the form of his life over the past year or so. And those are two world-class bowlers who are capable of, uh, you know, doing some real damage to the Sri Lankan lineup. Um, and then you have, two bowlers who are perhaps more well-known for their white ball um, exploits like uh, Kotsia and, um, and Marco Janssen. So it's a good South African bowling lineup, certainly one that could cause the Sri Lankan batters trouble. But um, what are kind of some of the key battles that you're looking at, key players that you're looking at um, from the Sri Lankan batting point of view in combating a very good South African attack? Estelle, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think Demoti is going to be a big wicket. I know when you look at Sri Lanka's team, obviously he's he's the one you look at. But I think he hasn't really had the type of runs he wants. And I said this before the England series as well, right? These are the series where he wants to get runs. If, if he is to establish his legacy, these are the series that he needs to get runs. Um, and... Him against Rabada is going to be a big battle. I think Chandimal as well, since he's batting at number three or is expected to bat at number three in this series, is going to be big because Patum hasn't played in South Africa, right? He hasn't played test cricket in South Africa. Yeah. You've got Kamindu who hasn't played. I know Kamindu is like the modern day Donald Bradman, but he, <laughs> I mean, at some point, he's going to have a couple of failures, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you can't kind of begrudge him that as well because he's done so well over the last couple of um, series. So, you, again, and I think this is this is like what, what I said before the England series as well. They, you have to have those senior batters stand up. You've got to have your Angelo Matthews, D- Dinesh Chandimal, Dimut Karnaratna getting runs because I feel like... Sri Lanka, in terms of the bowling attack they have, can do some damage against South Africa's batting lineup. But it'll come down. It 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 looks like it'll come down to how well they handle the bowling because we've notoriously been bad against left arm spin for whatever reason as well. So <laughs> Maharaj is going to be another big threat. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with Estelle. I think the top order is really crucial. That top four. Uh, We saw in the first couple of tests in England that they struggled to set a platform, build a platform Mm -hmm. that, you know, come into DDS and, um, well, Kusal was in the top order then, but Kusal now can build upon. And so I think it's going to be really, really crucial that that we see a hundred or some hundreds from that top three of Mm -hmm. Dimuth, Patum and Chandi. And yeah, I mean, you just hope that at some point, Kamindu can score some runs. At some point, Kusul can score some runs. And uh, I just think, I think Asifa has to have a huge series. And mm-hmm. I think Kumara has to bowl tightly. We can't see the kind of spray gun Kumara that um, can lose his radar. He's got to be, you know, on that fourth stump line, yep. hitting hard lengths. Because, you know, you mentioned Durban 2019, Dom, and this isn't the same stain, Rabada, um, Olivier, yeah. I think was more cool still yeah. around then. It's not quite as threatening a, as an attack, but like you say, Rabada got to 300 wickets, I think as fast as anyone has done in terms of balls, yeah. and Maharaj has been in great form, and then they're backed up by a cast of big dudes who we know yeah. are going to steam in, bowl fast and hit the pitch hard. So it's going to be a challenge for Sri Lanka's batters, right? Because it's not the sort of conditions that they're used to. I mean, you could see some of these guys going around the wicket to come into and him playing some mm. strokes and maybe nicking yeah. off early. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be tough. It's, uh, yeah, I, I think that top order runs are really crucial. Mm. Uh 
And I think you've just got to think about winning one of these two tests. Right? Yeah. I think if you yeah. win one of these two tests and you can stay in the game and you know you've got Australia coming to Gaul in, at the end of January, you back yourself to beat them twice on pitches yeah. that you can prepare if you can just take one of these games. But I, and I'm... it's also like, if you look at 2019, as well as the most recently concluded like India-New Zealand series, right? If you do win the first game, the likelihood of you going to nil is is really high because I don't know what happens to to the opposition, right? Because <laughs> in both those series, like nobody expected either New Zealand or Sri Lanka to take even one game in the series, and then you suddenly win the first game. You do something special in the first game, and I mean Sri Lanka won that game on the back of one innings, right? So like you do yeah. something special in the first game, and then you never know two nil is is possible. I I. I mean, I understand that a lot of people will not see it that way because South Africa is a good team, and I agree. But I think if Sri Lanka can do something in that first game, if if they can put up a good performance the way they played against England. In England, I thought they were good in patches, right? They just couldn't finish things off. I mean, that series could easily have been 2-1 Sri Lanka. Yeah. But they just couldn't complete like the good runs they had. If mm. they can do that in that first game, if Asita can have a good game, if if the top four, like you said, and there's no excuse, right? You've got three of your most experienced batters in the top four. Yep. If they can get the runs, then like anything can happen in the second test if, if you got a result in the first one. And, you know, I, I think, Estelle, one thing that I was thinking is to me, Potham is the X factor. Mm-hmm. I, say, I, I think you tell him, go out and be aggressive, play your drives. If you get out early, that's okay. Uh, because we've seen how good and how confident he looks once he you know, gets into that mode where he's driving the ball and cutting the ball. Uh, he's so, so good. And I'd, I'd almost tell him, go out and have a free hit, play one of those generational innings and, and get us a good score, right? Um, and I think the first match where it's kind of, you know, if you're Sri Lanka, you're thinking, this is a, this is a free hit, effectively. Mm. Go out, play aggressive, tell, tell Potham to play aggressively, um, tell Kamindu to play aggressively, tell Kusal to play aggressively, and have that little bit of, like, punch, right? Because you know South Africa is going to come out punching with their big bowlers and their... Yeah. Uh, there's and the last thing we a lot want, of aggressive battles for them as well, right? Exactly for them to be intimidating. We want to come out there and and play our own brand of cricket and say let's get runs on the board, let's get them on the board quickly and put South Africa behind the button early. Um, and that that that's my kind of thought is that you let the guys who are not seniors and you tell them you give them free license and you say you mm. be aggressive, uh, you do you play your natural game. Try to score runs. If you fail, we've got, you know, Dimuth, Angelo, Chandi, and DDS, right? Four really, really good test batters who should be able to shore up this lineup and get us runs no matter what. Um, I w- the other person who we haven't talked about is DDS. I think he's going to mm-hmm. be kind of a key figure here. I think his batting, he had he threatened to put on kind of t- t- to put up a brilliant innings in England, but never really did so. But now more than ever, I think that that he's going to have to really, um, he, he's going to need 100 in one of these matches to, if Sri Lanka wants to pull off a victory. And I think he's going to have to be really smart about his bowling. I think there were a couple times in the England series, again, that Estelle said, we could have potentially won two to one, where we kind of didn't have any purpose in what we were doing. Um, like sets of 10 overs where we're like, okay, we'll just bowl come into for a little bit and get to the new ball, right? Um, I want to see him take that next step as a captain and really be aggressive and go for go for the win. Um, because again, there's nothing to lose. Play as hard as you can. We've got a talented squad. And I it's a South African batting lineup that I think if you get into, you know, um, the top order is a little bit shaky. To be honest, um, Aiden Markram's been out of form. Kristen Stubbs is batting at three. He's not your traditional uh, number three test batter. Tony DeZorzi had a, a great um, last test match against Bangladesh. Mm. But I think if the Sri Lankan bowlers are up and at him early, and especially Lahiru Kumar, I think he's the big X factor. 
because he's the guy who can be aggressive and bowl on those South African pitches, like, um, you know, in a way that the others really can't. So I'm excited to see that. Um, we will talk more about this next week, I'm sure, uh, because we'll do a preview for the series once we get a, a, um, some idea of what the eleven's going to look like, what South Africa's eleven's going to look like, and we will be coming to you with a lot of content. Any other final comments or last words before we sign off for today? I have one. <laughs> I, I, I got I got you guys to watch a video. Uh, I won't name names or anything, yes, but yes, yes, yes. basically how... If Sri Lanka make the, it based, I mean, there, were, there was a lot discussed in it. But one of the points made was that a team like Sri Lanka making the World Test Championship final wouldn't necessarily be good for the game of Test cricket, right? Well, if Test cricket, if if that is the case, then I don't think Test cricket should exist, right? If it's if it's only going to exist with the victories of certain teams, then it's not a it's not a kind of format that should matter to the global audience. So I really hope that Sri Lanka can really, you know, they've they've often been motivated by stuff like that. Yeah. I remember was it was it Kepler Vessels who said something during the last series about uh, something to do with you know playing a county team or whatever yeah they seem to be motivated by those things so i hope they hear those kind of things from former players and pundits and stuff like that and it really motivates them because they've got to this position because they've played really good cricket over the last couple of years right in the world test championship they've not just in this cycle, but they've been good in the previous cycle as well. So it's no accident or it's, I mean, a lot of people are going to come back and say, because New Zealand beat India, that opened things up. And it did, right? But you also have to admit that Sri Lanka has played really good test cricket. And if they can win away or draw this series away, yeah. I think that will go a long way into getting them that recognition that they deserve because they've they've been genuinely a good test team over the last couple of years. And people like, Dimut, I think, gets credit, but I don't think the, the likes of Chandimal, uh, DDS and Angelo get enough credit for the types of middle order batters they've been for Sri Lanka and in, in the game over the last couple of years. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that like the results that we've seen over the past six months, Sri Lanka winning in England, New Zealand winning in India, Bangladesh winning in Pakistan, have been really good for Test cricket. And it totally... like. Uh, debunks this theory that the game should just be some ugly threesome between England, India and Australia and that everyone else can go and do one. And so, yeah, I hope that we... I would love to see a WTC final between Sri Lanka and New Zealand. They're all going, or, right? If we, if we do oh, yeah, make we, it. We've committed yeah, it. We've we're committed going. to it. Um, or Sri Lanka uh, and South Africa. And I think that they're like the idea that that's bad for the game is just like totally out of touch. I think it's exactly what cricket needs. And I think it's great that we're entering the last six months of the WTC cycle uh, with everything all to play yeah. for. And England and India both kind of like seem to be out of the running, right? And that we're talking about other teams. Uh, <laughs> that, that's the crazy thing, right? Like, how can you say it's bad for test cricket when there's been so much discussion of test cricket because of the way these other teams are playing, because of the way New Zealand's playing, because of the way Pakistan's playing, because of the way Sri Lanka's playing, right? They're the drivers of the narrative, right? Otherwise, you're just waiting six months for the next Border Gavaskar or the next Ashes series or whatever, right? And I, I'm i so excited to see these teams play, and it's high-quality test cricket. We, you know, we saw the series in England. That was really good cricket. That was excellent cricket to watch. Um, and I think th there's this narrative that Sri Lanka, you know, sometimes they don't play well and they don't look great. And, you know, the comparison is always they look like a, a bad county team. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's nonsense. We know that's not true. Um, and I think I'd love to see them prove the haters wrong who think of this team as a team that only wins because, uh, you know, they're already they've already started p uh, prepping the pitch and golf for Australia down in February. Right. This um, is a team. Yeah, go ahead, Nick. No, no, go, go. no one says that shit when England get rolled for 100 in Pakistan and look like they can't mm. play spin. Right. It's yeah. these are the things that get said about smaller test nations. Yeah. And, you know, like 
I mean, I just, this time two years ago when South Africa started the SAT20, everyone was saying, oh, they've given up on test cricket. They're, they're basically gone. You know, Mark was so disconsolate that he was saying we might as well, like, quit playing test cricket because we don't yeah. get opportunities. And so, like, what's happening now, I feel, is a chance to change that narrative and to go back to a time when test cricket was more equal uh mm. like you know the fact that england aren't here i know they've had points stopped for slow over rates but and they've had tough series against india and australia but they play twice as much test cricket against yeah. mm. ev as everyone else and they're not in the final so how we can say that these like other sides are lesser i i just don't agree with it yeah and how cool is it to, that you have players like Basically, like Demuth and Chundi, who, okay, Chundi is in the T20 squad, but, you know, are effectively red ball players, right? And this is what, this is like the, the, the zenith, right? This is the, the moment for them to shine. And they are, like, in South Africa getting ready. Um, I can't wait to watch. I can't, um, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a competitive series. And we will have that covered for you. All right, guys. Well, I think that wraps it up. This has been the Morally End. Thank you for listening. If you're still here and you haven't subscribed, I don't know what you're doing. Please subscribe, like, comment, and tell us how you feel. Thank you. Bye.